for December the 3rd is entitled Finding God on the Bottom Shelf. The key verse is Matthew 5, 12, which says, Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. The scripture is from Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12. The lesson focus, God's blessing can be found in unlikely places. In the overview, it says that the Methodist missionary E. Stanley Jones confessed that he once had thought God's best virtues were put on high shelves where only the ascended masters could reach them, but he later came to understand that God actually puts them on the lowest shelves where people have to stoop in order to find them. If this is true, then the curse of sin ironically means that we are all born too tall rather than too short for the things of God. It means that God is hidden in the quiet often humbling places we forget to search in our quest to find him he who came quietly into the world during the night birthed by an unwed teenager placed in a manger and observed first by shepherds still moves seamlessly among us today in a thousand different places and predicaments and god's m o is perhaps best summarized here in the beatitudes in the introduction it says that jesus is among the most quoted yet least understood characters in the world. His pithy sayings have made their way onto billboards, talk shows, and gospel tracts, and none of his sayings is more clever or ironic than those in the Beatitudes found in Matthew 5. Jesus blessed those who seemed cursed, and cursed those who seemed blessed. Gathering with the crowds on a hillside in Galilee, Jesus brought his disciples around him, and with a ring of Pharisees standing in the back, he began to teach them the virtues of his upside-down kingdom. At the outset, some things need to be said about the nature of this important list of the blessed. One is that they are very simple. Three of every four words are one syllable, and the longest, most difficult word is persecuted. A fourth grader could understand this sermon and yet it is precisely the part of Scripture that we do understand that gives us the most trouble. This is probably because these sayings are so radical compared to whatever life we, including the saints, are used to living. After all, who of us wants to finish last in a heated argument? And who really yearns to mourn or thirst for righteousness? Let's be honest. Do we truly desire to seek God when there is so much fun to be had? And when it comes to suffering, who wants to take it upon themselves when there is much being dished out already? Yet the Beatitudes do not come as a secret formula for happiness. These are not be happy attitudes, for Jesus does not promise happiness, but instead blessing to those who suffer. It is insensitive to suppose that a grieving widow, a bankrupt merchant, or a bleeding martyr can be happy about his or her predicament. The blessedness that Jesus spoke about is not a stubborn denial of the facts but a quiet and sure confidence that God is as trustworthy in the worst of times as in the best. We can find him in the least likely places. In part one, it says that people of God's kingdom are blessed through helplessness. And the text is from Matthew 5, verses 1 through 3, which says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. While Pharisees sought honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. As affirmed in Mary's magnificent, God had lifted up the humble and sent the rich away empty. To be poor in spirit is to be helpless in this world and thus at the mercy of God. It is not self-hatred. Rather, it is to be so consumed with God and His righteousness that we see our own sin, mortality, and helplessness in light of Him. In his epistles, Paul moved from seeing himself as the least of the apostles to the least of all the Lord's people to the worst of sinners. 
so the more that Paul comprehended of God, the less of himself he admired. It is the ultimate paradox. The richer we become spiritually, the poorer we become in spirit. In part two, it says, People of God's kingdom are blessed when hurting. And the text is from Matthew 5, verse 4, which says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. It is always more fun to laugh. Clearly, this is not forbidden by Jesus, who offered us life to the full, and who himself showed good evidence of a sense of humor. But Jesus' point is, even those who mourn will find comfort entangled with their grief. Like Moses, they will climb the mountain of terror, heading straight into the thunder and the smoke of life, and there they will find God even in the dark. While Pharisees sneered at poverty and mourned while they fasted, the real people of God have it the other way around. We will be comforted while we mourn, and we maintain composure when we fast. In part three, it says that people of God's kingdom are blessed with humility, and the text is from Matthew 5, verse 5, which says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. New Testament professor Donald Carson has written that, Though we don't think of it so overtly, each of us tends to assume that we are basically at the center of the universe, so for good reason we all relate poorly to the more than seven billion others who are laboring under the same delusion. No wonder it is hard for us to obtain the blessing that is due to the meek. It seems like the only earth any of us will inherit is the sod directly over our graves. But meekness, as Jesus meant it, is not the habit of backing down. It is the virtue of putting others before oneself, and in turn putting oneself in the hand of God. The Pharisees love to be called teacher, but the real people of God love to be taught. After all, a disciple of Jesus is a learner of him who is gentle and humble in heart. Mother Teresa was one example of how the meek inherit the earth with their influence. The world craves the presence of this virtue it so desperately lacks. In part 4, it says that people of God's kingdom are blessed with hunger, and the text is from Matthew 5, verse 6, which says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. First century Palestinians knew all too well the analogy of famine and drought. They were everywhere. And Jesus said here, that it should last forever, if it is righteousness we crave. We should be careful that we do not settle all of the tensions in our claim to be entirely sanctified, for if by sanctified we mean the end of either our frustration with sin or our quest for godliness, we are like the mythological Greek Icarus who flew too close to the sun and was destroyed by it. Put another way, if we are filled to the point that we no longer hunger and thirst, then we have something other than real righteousness in our bellies. So blessed are those who do not rest on their reputations, whose contentment is mixed with holy discontent, who like what they've had enough of to desire even more. Blessed are they whose sins bother them even as their holiness consoles them. They will find God in this awkward tension. In part 5, it says, People of God's kingdom do no harm. And the text is from Matthew 5, verse 7, which says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. It was like the Pharisees to point out the sins of others with a magnifying glass. Jesus warned them to be cautious and conservative in their judgment of sinners, because in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. Even so, it is possible that part of the standard by which we are measured on Judgment Day will be self-imposed. That is, we are presently writing our own final examination in the way we handle others. By merciful, Jesus meant the capacity to get inside of another person's situation and to understand the forces that motivate them. We have mercy not that we may acquit that person, but that we may be more patient, bearing with them. In just this way, we will be shown mercy because we have learned to approach others as people equally in need of grace. 
in part 6, it says that people of God's kingdom are holy. And the text is from Matthew 5, verse 8, which says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. To the Jews, people's hearts were their spiritual homes. The heart was the seat of their affections, the bent to their ways. From their hearts they saw the world and lived every moment. The pure in heart, then, are those whose motives are sincere, whose minds are rated G, whose mistakes are honest, whose souls are undivided, whose humor, passions, checkbooks, and wandering thoughts all flow from the same pure stream. They will see God in this world like an artist will see the character in a painting or a musician will hear it in a song. They are most apt to appreciate the many facets of God's holiness now that they have a little of it themselves. These days, it is as precious as it is rare to find someone whose heart is pure. That many who read this doubt whether such a person exists is more of a testament of our times than it is of the text. In part 7, it says that people of God's kingdom are harmonious, and the text is from Matthew 5, verse 9, which says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Historians tell us that since the time of Moses, we have seen only 268 years when there was not war somewhere on the globe. Since 1958, over 100 nations have been involved in some kind of conflict. Peacemakers today are the baggage of war. They are polite men and women who wear expensive suits, fly in private jets, and meet in neutral countries to hammer out agreements neither side intends to keep. Jesus had something else in mind. By peace, he meant shalom, the quiet, contented conviction that God is in heaven and all is well with the world. More than the end of war, it is the beginning of trust. More than the absence of crime, it is the presence of justice. It is the placid look on the face of a young couple watching their children frolic in the yard. It is the weathered smile of an old farmer as he sits down with his family for a Christmas dinner. Here, as in the chaotic periods of life, God is hiding in the well-rested soul. These are the children of God. They bear the image of him who rested on the seventh day, who gave prisoners their jubilee, who breaks the bow and shatters the spear. In part 8, it says that people of God's kingdom will be harassed. And the text is from Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12, which says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus finished his list by blessing the most common condition among his audience. Most of his listeners that day either had come out of persecution or were soon headed for it. Within a few days, the Pharisees, whose ancestors killed the prophets, would turn up the heat on Jesus and his followers until many would desert Jesus to avoid the trouble. They were persecuted because of righteousness, which is another way of saying that Christ's enemies had become theirs. For this they inherited the kingdom of heaven in this world and the reward in heaven in the world to come. The Apostle Peter is said to have seen Jesus again on the day he was crucified upside down. The first martyr, Stephen, saw the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. The missionaries have witnessed to their tormentors as they died at their tormentors' hands. In today's life application, it says, the Beatitudes form the perfect contrast between self-righteousness and genuine Christianity. Do you find yourself stuck in the old life, trying voraciously to live out this pattern, or do these virtues flow from within? God has come down and hidden himself in the strangest of places and predicaments. Even so, the reward of God is not only something to wait for, it is here and now. Those in trouble may rejoice that the kingdom of God has found them. They have the life of God in them. 
This is what it means to overcome the world. This is life to the full. This is eternal life. This is holiness.